Hey everyone, Nathan here, president of Saybrook University. Welcome to another episode of Saybrook Insights. So as I prepared my interview with today's guest, Dr. Vanessa Brown, I was reminded of Saybrook's incredible legacy uh, in the work of humanistic psychology. I mean, we are one of the premier humanistic psychology institutions. Um, and the Saybrook Genesis story is grounded in that humanistic psychology arc of a story emerging from a convening of humanistic psychologists back in 1964. And yep, you guessed it, Old Saybrook, Connecticut. That's where we get our name. And the concept of humanistic psychology institutes that were anchored to institutions of higher education, but not always, some kind of separate and independent. Eventually, over the years, especially through the 1960s, there would be just a handful of these institutions that clung to that humanistic ethos as other uh, HPIs, as they were called, or humanistic psychology institutes, uh, were absorbed into psychology programs and uh, kind of more standardized curriculums. And this handful of institutions uh, was led in large part by uh, one of the HPIs at Sonoma State, which eventually became a nonprofit entity in San Francisco, California, and would become the Sabra Graduate Research Center uh, or Graduate Center and Research Institute and eventually Saybrook University. And over our 52 years, we've held on to these humanistic principles as important guideposts really for all our programs beyond psychology, including integrative health, counseling, systems, uh, organizational leadership, transformative social change, you name it, we've got it. And it's all threaded with that humanistic ethos, that humanistic philosophy. And in addition to Saybrook's unique role as a leader in distance education and the graduate level, um, it was really the fact that our faculty are leaders in their field supporting this rigorous, outstanding education. So we've got this amazing flexibility and these incredible faculty uh, and really support our students on, you know, who make their way to our institution to, to study in these disciplines. And the history we have is rich and our philosophical moorings powerful, as I really just described. And these distinctive approaches uh, have really drawn incredible leaders, such as our first head of the school, Dr. Eleanor Criswell, the Rollo May and James Bugenthal and, you know, Abraham Maslow, and many others. That's really what drew me initially to Saybrook University back in 2014 when I started talking to a headhunter about uh, these two schools that were on her radar. And she really thought, with my background, this could be uh, an interesting journey. And after meeting the myriad faculty and our board members and our students, I, I fell in love. Because the idea of being in journey together, in a process together, in education together, it's just awesome. And it really shines through at Saybrook University. Um, I'm entering my eighth year as president, and I feel every day like I made the best decision of my professional life. And I think so many of our faculty, our staff, our students feel very similarly. Yeah, there are hard days. There are hard days in any job. There are hard days in any institution where you're going to school. But on balance, in total, that mission is so powerful and it undergirds everything that we do. And that humanistic feeling, that ethos, it's just so uh, like, it's like getting wrapped up in a blanket. So I love it. And our Dr. Vanessa Brown, my guest today, who's a Saybrook University faculty member in our clinical psychology department with a core focus in humanistic principles. Dr. Brown comes to Saybrook with a rich, rich, rich background in humanistic psychology and the traditions there. And I'm excited to have her shed light on, you know, the field, its applications, and her role as a leader in the Society for Humanistic Psychology and Maybe you dig into a few, few areas around mental health and well-being from that humanistic perspective. No doubt this interview is going to be a treat for all of the budding and experienced psychologists out there. And I think you're going to like what she has to say about her work uh, across the board, including her work as a feminist psychologist and her work in advancing women in the profession. All right, let's get to it with Dr. Vanessa Brown. Dr. Vanessa Brown, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just had the pleasure of seeing you at our recent 
Saybrook University Residential Learning Experience Seminar. Before we get started here on Saybrook Insights for the, your episode, maybe just introduce yourself to the audience. What, where did you come from? What, what brought you to Saybrook University? What was your evolution? Uh, thank you, Nathan. Uh, so I'm Vanessa Brown, and I'm the Associate Chair for Clinical Psychology here at Saybrook. And I have the pleasure of working alongside Dr. Theopia Jackson. So my story, I am an alum from, from the Michigan School of Psychology, um, and that's where I still live over here in Michigan. And before coming over to Saybrook, I was teaching there as well as an adjunct and uh, supervising students. So interesting story is that uh, me and my husband met while we were in graduate school, and he is now Michigan School of Psychology's program director. For just a period of a few weeks, we were actually, he was my boss, and I was his uh, I was his employee, and so I'm like, I got to back myself out of this situation. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But that was fun, so we kind of had, uh, you know, some ribbing going on. So now it's really nice because we have in our household um, two people from really wonderful humanistic institutes, and so so the dialogue in our house is so fun. Um, we're both on the executive board for the Society for Humanistic Psychology, which is Division 32 of the American Psychological Association. And I've sat on that board for about four years now. Um, but even as a student, I was really passionate about humanistic psychology and very active in that division. That's very cool. Whereabouts in Michigan are you? So me and my husband live in the Detroit area, and we have a three-year-old son here, too. Oh, very good. So that kid is going to grow up in a humanistic psychology environment. That's that's pretty awesome. You bet. And we'll see if he rolls with it or rebels against it. <laughs> he might become a Freudian. Who knows? A behaviorist. That's right. That's so cool. Well, listen, really glad to have you on here. One of the exciting things about having you being so steeped in humanistic psychology both in your education, your teaching, and also your service work as a, as a faculty member and a psychologist is to learn more about it and to get a better sense of what it is, what it, you know, what you do, those types of things. So as we get started and for those just learning about what humanistic psychology is, can you describe from a therapist's point of view and then maybe an educator's point of view, what this humanistic thing is, what it isn't, what it looks like when applied, et cetera. Yeah, so humanistic psychology um, really was founded in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. Um, but before that, there was many, many different cultural contexts that were already talking about these same human ideas. Um, so from an indigenous perspective or from a feminist perspective, these ideas have been around for a very long time. It wasn't it just wasn't um, put in language, put in context um, in a psychological way until the 1950s. So what it means to be a humanist psychologist or humanistic educator is that you are, are um, looking at humans as larger than the sum of their parts. And what that means is that you steep them in a context. So instead of reducing someone to, for example, a student role, which implies that they're coming in um, almost as a blank slate, like mold me, teach me, tell me what your wisdom is, we accept that people come in with their own wisdom and experiences and um, even understanding that they come with a lineage attached to them as well. So there's like an ancestral wisdom that is inherent in people. And so humanistic psychologists believe that there is a natural growth potential that even if we don't interfere at all, humans are already on a path to growing and to be uh, moving towards their highest potential. Um, so as psychologists, our role is to be more of a guide or a mentor. So we, we collaborate, we co-create the therapeutic experience with our clients. And we do the same thing as humanistic educators too. So with our students, we are asking them to share what their wisdom and experiences are, which sometimes that means is going to place my students at a expert level that's greater than my own as a professor. And I'm okay with that because there are certain areas where I have more expertise than my students. And so in that way, we're co-creating the classroom either, even. They're going to bring in questions that are from their expert level, and I'm going to um, try to help guide them to the next level to bring it even further than them, what they have right now. That is an excellent, very concise, and clear understanding of humanistic psychology. I appreciate that. So 
Let's get into some of the the controversy though around like you know some people would say well that's kind of, I'll just play devil's advocate because you know I I'm a supporter but I I think at the at the other end of the extreme some people would say well that's kind of a cop out right like people want led people want taught I mean like this co-creating of experiences isn't that is that really teaching is that really therapy is that really just kind of letting the uh, tail wag the dog, so to speak. Um, what do you, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I would say that um, that's a really limiting perspective. And we call that like reductionist in the humanistic lens. Um, so what, what we're doing there is it's almost like uh, if we think about the rote memorization model that we all were trained in in high school and in undergraduate school, um, that is very limiting because what happens is we memorize all of that knowledge we are filled with. And then the moment we leave that institution, half of its garbage. We, we forget it. It just goes out of our brain, right? So if we instead look at what the human potential is and tap into what each individual is bringing, we tap into their passion. We tap into what's meaningful to them as humans, and we start to synthesize knowledge. And so what our students end up doing is that when I teach them something, for example, right now I'm teaching developmental psychology, I'm asking them, tell me a story that relates to these stage theories that we're going to memorize still, we're going to know them very deeply because you are required to, but we're going to know them so deeply that you're going to attach them to memories and wisdom that you're already coming in with. And so it actually ends up being a much deeper level of learning because we're able to play with it and use it in a different way. And so we're, we're in, we end up training psychologists who are able on the fly to be adaptive with their clients because clients don't come in with a uniform set of concerns. Cl clients come in with the variety and diversity and context. And so you as a therapist has to have to be able to think in those adaptive ways. And, and that means attaching them to what you come in as an individual with. That's such a great, great response to that, because I, I have heard that critique of the humanistic pedagogy and, and approach even. And so, so I really appreciate you bringing and bearing light on that. So if you kind of take it to the, the therapist room, right. And, and, you and I are together. You're my therapist. Um, how do you approach that? You're in journey with the client, right? So the idea is that, you know, you're co-creating this experience. You know, I know it's very context dependent and everyone brings a whole host of issues, but what does it look like uh, from the therapist's point of view when you're using a humanistic approach to therapeutic intervention? Yeah, and because each therapist is bringing in their own wisdom and set of skills, that is really going to look different. For me, um, it's a lot of getting to know one another through stories. So I really want to hear um, what makes up that person's context, what's important to them. So a lot of times it just feels like you're dialoguing with um, a friend or a colleague. Um, so we're, I'm just saying, you know, what happened this week? And my clients will tell me. And as they're telling me their story, I'm really listening on a much deeper level um, I'm even using my body as an instrument in that moment. So I'm noticing if any tension comes up for me or if any um, images or stories from my own life are coming up and relating to what the client's speaking about. And then I might even share that with my client. I might even um, self-disclose. And Rogers has a whole body of literature that really is in support of self-disclosure because um, if you think about it, we uh, many therapists don't have an option to self-disclose or not. If you are a therapist, for example, with very dark skin, you immediately bring that into the room as part of a self-disclosure about your identity. And so Rogers was very much in support of self-disclosure after doing some self-reflection. That was very good. Thank you for that. That was absolutely terrific. So, so I want to kind of lean into that self-disclosure piece a bit. It, it, because it, it actually was swimming in my mind as you were talking about this. I read this New York Times article when I first started at Saybrook, and it was this, it, it was kind of like a confessions of a humanistic therapist. I can't remember the name. You may remember the article I'm talking about where the therapist basically tells the client he's kind of bored with the whole conversation. He's not feeling great about it. And I'm thinking if I were a client, I don't know how I'd feel about that. Sure. Maybe, I guess maybe that leads you to not having therapy with that person anymore. But what's, what's the value of the self-disclosure for the client? I can understand the therapist for sure in terms of the benefits, but what about for the client? 
For the client, one of the, the major things is modeling interpersonal relationships. And so oftentimes clients are experiencing distress that's related to um, not being able to be authentic or congruent with how they want to be. And so if the therapist then can model, here's an effective way to be congruent and we can work through interpersonal conflicts that occur in this moment, um, because this is a safe space, right? Or relatively safe space. Um, out in the world, not so much so. So first we get to practice here. Uh, it's almost like scaffolding. We get to practice here on an easier um, level, and then we get to generalize those skills out in the world. And from a feminist perspective, which I, I also subscribe to feminist psychology, um, in the therapy room, often there's a power differential that gets created with the therapist coming in immediately with some sense of authority or expertise, um, which then puts the client in a one down position. Um, so part of self-disclosure is to equalize that power differential so that your client feels um, more able to disclose the things that they want to talk about and the intense emotions that they might be experiencing. That's very helpful. So, you, so in your case, you would use it as a tool for modeling, which um, I really, I, that seems like a very uh, apt approach in terms of the therapeutic model. What about, how does that translate into the classroom environment uh, for, for you uh, as you uh, apply these humanistic approaches? Yeah, in the classroom, I often will strategically use stories as examples for what I'm teaching about. Um, so it, I just was teaching human sexuality. And so I might use some stories about how I was uncomfortable as a woman sharing with my gynecologist certain things. Um, and so then we're talking about data that applies to women and their experiences of pregnancy or birth or menstruation. And then I'm putting myself in that category as a woman. And so that really drives the point home as a personal experience. This isn't, we're not just talking about numbers or data or dehumanizing individuals. We're talking about me and everyone else in the room here. So I will strategically weave in narratives as appropriate when my uh, when I'm teaching students. That's really helpful. Okay, no, that's great. So uh, rewind just a bit, and then I want to kind of fast forward into how the you know subdiscipline, the field actually of of humanistic psychology uh, has has evolved because you you've you're part of a whole new generation of humanistic psychologists that are out there as they start to. I'm considered a geriatric millennial. That's my that's my generation. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about that. You know, <laughs> for me too, because I think I fall in. Well, I think I fall a little bit later than you. So, um, but if you really kind of look at the you know the name of the humanistic movement, it's called the third force in psychology. So we're rewinding a bit. Can you help us understand what the other two forces were and why why there's a juxtaposition between these three? Maybe there is less so now, but your thoughts on that would be great. Yeah, I think there's probably still a little bit of a just juxtaposition, um, but we're seeing more person-centered approaches um, just sort of weaved into all all approaches to therapy now. So the first wave was behaviorism, and there was really an attempt there to fit it into the medical model. So all of the language, we're talking about like B.F. Skinner, you know, all of the language was about physiological responses and how we could manipulate those to have better outcomes for for people. Um, people were frequently referred to as patients or um, in like a scientific scientific um language like, you know, like a recipient. Okay. They were like the object of study in that, in that field. Um, and then we shifted over to our psychoanalytic and our cognitive therapies. And so um, that we, there we had Freud and Erickson um, and some of our psychoanalytic brothers and sisters. And um, they really believed that there was an unconscious realm that needed to be fixed. Um, so we had to bring all of that to the surface and work through it so that we could have um, better outcomes for individuals. And I would even put um, the cognitive behavioral into that second wave. So I'm um, trying to identify people's cognitive distortions and shift them to healthier cognitions. 
And then finally, we had our um, humanistic third force wave, which uh, really believed that, that we can't reduce people to their symptoms or their biology, that there's actually something even greater. And that that could be the interplay between that. That could be collectively our society. That could be our ancestry. There's, there's many, many other factors. And every time we try to pull one of those out, we're actually taking away from the full understanding of the individual. So we have to view the wholeness of the human experience, which anytime you try to take a look at it, it, it actually is very elusive. So it's not something you can look at through a microscope, and it's not something you can even really accurately assess, because as soon as you do an assessment on it, you're losing the full picture. And so that's um, sometimes been a critique of the humanistic wave is that it's not evidence-based, but that there is some intentionality with not being evidence-based. What a great example of, you know, like how this all kind of weaves together and what you just said about being evidence-based and I say not everything can. I think that's absolutely terrific. That really helps, I think, for those who are, you know, clinging to that as the the sole answer to how we solve some of our problems. It, it may not be, right? And so that's that's very helpful. I was talking to an Adlerian some time back, and an Adlerian psychologist. For those out there, uh, there is a gentleman named Adler <laughs> who had a particular approach to psychology. And we were, you know, I am not a psychologist by training, um, but uh, I play one here on TV with you uh, today. So uh, we're we're colleagues in arms in that way. Um, but as we were talking about humanistic psychology, his point was that, you know. Having a humanistic psychology institution is kind of a uh, anachronistic. It's part of the past. You know, psychology programs all have humanistic. Why do we even need to have like a separate institution that is just solely humanistic? And I said, well, I think for us, we we look at all the therapeutic interventions. We you know, help our students understand the the nuances and the applications and support them in the work that they're doing because uh, they're going to need all of those. And um, I, he, he scratched his head and he said, well, that's that's actually really kind of cool. I said, but our emphasis is really on humanistic psychology. So hopefully I told him correctly uh, about that and, and would like to get your thoughts on that. Like what what's the advantage of having humanistic institutions like Saybrook University and the Michigan School, uh, from your perspective? Part of it is that the humanistic tradition is weaved into every single class versus, you know, you might have a few hours. Uh, and I would say the metaphor is similar to if you went to medical school and you get that, you know, three hour workshop on nutrition versus nutrition being weaved in at every single, you know, symptom and diagnosis, right? And so that's, that's us at Saybrook is that we weave in humanistic um, into our pedagogy, into our admissions process, into, you know, the, like our accessibility in terms of how we have a hybrid program. Um, it's it's talked about in every single class. And so that's the advantage of having that humanistic school. It, and again, back to my point about the adaptability or the flexibility of thinking with our students is that they can always go back to that. Um, I have some students who are trained in applied behavior and analysis, um, ABA services, which is a really common um, intervention for autism spectrum disorder and frequently reimbursed by um, by insurance companies as the only intervention for autism spectrum disorder. Um, so typically that would go under those behavioral therapies that we talked about as those first wave, right? And so we are providing an intervention that's intended to manipulate a behavior. So someone on the spectrum um, is doing hand flapping, we apply an intervention so that they reduce the hand flapping. Okay. Um, a student who went to a humanistic school that also was trained in ABA is going to learn that um, that individual, that uh, child in front of us, we knew to examine what the hand flapping is doing for them and when it increases and when it decreases. And we're going to examine more what the meaning of that is for them before we apply the intervention. And when we choose an intervention, we're going to examine what's going to work best for that family. And um, we're not just going to do A, B to get to C, right? We're going to really do a lot more work to look at the full context there. That's a really great point, because if you're applying something, say, with the hand flapping, uh, uh, you know, a particular behavioral approach, 
it may stop for a while, but it may increase in intensity. And it could, if you're not investigating those, uh, those stimuli that may be causing that for that, you know, individual, you know, it may never resolve. Right. And so if you dig in deeper. Yeah, we're also sending them back into a family context. And so if if we've created dependency on the therapist, um, then this is going to be someone who potentially can't keep up or maintain that intervention. And so with the humanistic psychologist, we're again really tapping into what your individual potential is. And so for that child, what's going to work for them so they can continue it on with minimal intervention from a therapist? That's great. That's great. I, I'd like to not really shift, but go down this line a little bit longer. And then I want to get into your work in feminist psychology, as well as your work with supporting women psychologists in general. Given the current mental health crisis, there is such a vast need for therapists right now. And when we say mental health crisis, I mean, I don't know that it is accurately defined. Some people would say, is it really a crisis? I don't know. But I think for a lot of folks in America, across the country, at least here, here, they are feeling it, right? Whether it's the the increase in drug and alcohol use, suicidal ideation, um, you know, you name it, it's out there, and it's it's increasing in intensity for many. From a humanistic approach, and from how you're seeing things as a therapist, as an educator, what are your thoughts on the crisis, and how do we how do we start to chip away at this in a way that's meaningful, that's going to help us advance? Because right now, it feels like we're stuck in neutral. Yeah, the mental health crisis is real, that that there are facts that support that we have um, the highest number right now of uh, suicides per capita. We have, because of COVID, we're noticing that about 20% of individuals who have had COVID end up with depression or anxiety as a result of having COVID, not to mention just the isolation that's been occurring because of the pandemic. We have huge transitions, financial transitions, people who are working from home now people who are raising um, children at home while trying to work from home. And so all of those are compounding into a really stressful culture that we're experiencing in the United States. Meanwhile, we're also seeing um, difficulties in the behavioral health workforce. And so um, some states are making it more difficult for licensing to occur. And in addition to that, um, the the licensing boards, they're stressed too because of the staff shortage. And so it's kind of just all these compounding factors um, making, making it so that when an individual goes to find a therapist, one, they have to find one that they can afford. And that means tapping into what their health insurance um, is going to allow them to see. Um, Health insurance companies, I had just waited 14 months to get paneled with one health insurance company because of their own staff shortages. And so that meant that individuals with that health insurance weren't able to access um, somebody who was willing to take them on. So it's a human supply chain issue across the board. It's not just a therapist issue. Absolutely. Important perspective. I had not given thought to That's very helpful. Yeah, it's a huge system-wide issue. And so on average, um, patients might be looking at three-month wait in order to begin therapy. Um, so the APA actually has um, issued an initiative where they're um, supporting virtual uh, virtual access. You know, there's this really funny, uh, I wish I knew the name of the podcast, um, but there's this really funny one where they uh, tested out one of these virtual therapists. And essentially, it's like you type into a chat box, I'm feeling suicidal. And there's a virtual, not a real therapist, a virtual um, automated robot that responds back to try to maintain some of these crisis issues that are happening that we just don't have the workforce to handle. Um, and in this particular episode, the uh, robot had recommended just go into a pair of pajamas and that should probably help with your uh, suicidal thoughts. I think the one I saw is, can you pour me a beer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not going to work. Right. It, it's problematic. And then I, I guess too, like not to pick at the scab of APA, but we've got a whole issue here too of uh, nationally where, it, you know, we need to find better pathways towards getting therapists educated and and graduated and working right in the field because there is a dearth of therapists. Um, we also see the 
the drain, right? As soon as we graduate therapists, we have, I, I've seen varying statistics. Um, for every 10 that graduate, three to five are leaving the field. Some say it's as high as 13 leave for every 10 that come out in, into the workforce. It depends on the field and the area. Um, what are your thoughts about APA and the, you know, some of the uh, work that's being done, the lobbying in the states? I know this can be treading into some dangerous political territory, so I'll let you take the question as you see fit. I actually think the APA has been really upfront about their misgivings lately. Um, they recently had their apology for racism, and they have very much so acknowledged that there's a mental health um, shortage and even listed a multi-point plan for addressing that. It's, it's kind of like uh, if you think of the APA as a whole, that's really a misgiving because the APA has many different limbs and sometimes the right hand isn't aware of what the left hand is doing. And so um, we have accreditation bodies um, and that's the APA accreditation. And most states are moving towards that, which actually makes it more difficult for students to progress through. And because of the APA's history of racism, there's many, many barriers to um, certain populations getting a license in psychology. Um, so we know that marginalized groups, people of color, um, and uh, people who are at low, low socioeconomic statuses, those uh, even military um, individuals, those individuals unlikely to get accepted into an APA program, afford an APA program, and matriculate from an APA program. And that's just, you know, that's statistics that even the APA will publish. Um, and so while that's true, we still have this trend towards states wanting APA accreditation. Um, so there's something there that has to change because it's incongruent. I get it, right? I mean, you know, my dad was, uh, you know, essentially in, in social work and mental health uh, work back in Ohio, I, I, you know, there's the the rub, right? There's the the need to ensure standards for patient sa client safety, right? At the end of the day, and the APA provides probably the most comprehensive set of criteria for that, and it's very comprehensive. Um, but to your point, it's also very limiting in terms of the access and uh, ability to get folks into the workforce, into the therapeutic workforce and doing the work that needs done. How do you protect the patient, hold standards, and, and I should make sure I'm using the correct terminology, client, and, and also making sure that we're getting the right supply of therapists out there? I mean, what, are, what thoughts do you have in that space? Well, each state has a licensing board that's already, um, that, is, that is their job, is to protect the public. And so each state gets to choose what their regulations are, which is, uh, allows them to be a little bit more culturally relevant than what a national APA board is going to be knowing. Um, and so I know in the state of Michigan right now, we have a board of psychology. And when I'm ready to matriculate, I actually have to go apply to that board. They review all of my classes. They review review my licensing board exam, the hours and where I did those. And so that's going to be a much more comprehensive examination than what the APA is doing anyways. The APA is only looking at um, that university setting and the courses and the staff that are there. Okay. All right. So your bottom line is states are doing this anyway. So why are we? They're already doing it. Yeah. That's a great point. All right. I want to talk about the fun stuff, the great stuff, the good work you're doing in advancing uh, uh, the support of women, your focus in feminist psychology. Um, I think you have a clear stake in this, but talk about as well, like what what drew you to this? How is your passion manifested in this in this space? You know, it's funny as I never wanted to be a woman psychologist studying women. That seems kind of like a trope to me. So I was sort of trying to avoid that. Um, but what I'm noticing, and I think a lot, many people who have a marginalized status also feel this, is that you do sort of get drawn towards that because you want to be an advocate for yourself and for your community. Um, so my advocacy started when I started to notice some of the microaggressions that I experienced as a student and then as a professional. Um, and I didn't want other women psychologists to experience that. So one of the things I've been working on recently with my colleague Donna Rockwell, who works in the mind-body medicine um, department, is uh, we've been upping our numbers of women authors 
and reviewers and editors in humanistic psychology journals. And so one of the initiatives that her and I did was to do a blast out um, to our women colleagues and who wants to be a peer reviewer so that we can just flood this database with women reviewers who are going to look at articles with a little bit different lens than some of our uh, male colleagues. Um, and I also want to say that when Donna and I define women, we define women as a self-identified group. So that could be anyone who has identified as a woman in the past or um, identifies as a woman now. Um, and so the, that was our call out. But also I think Donna and I really are attuned to people who are um, non male identified. Um, that's important because when you look at statistics, there is a huge number of people who identify as women in the field of psychology, but there is not the same um, level uh, of women who represent um, professors, authors, and reviewers in the field. And so there ha there's a discrepancy that happens, and there's a certain age that that happens at too, and it happens around age 30. So we see lots of women entering into the field of psychology, and then a huge drop off, and they disappear. They become invisible. Um, so that was one of the questions I wanted to answer is, where are all the women? As um, somebody who is in her late 30s now, I think what ends up happening is that there is a huge societal pressure pressure to start focusing on family and the um, pressure that's required as a psychologist to maintain contact with lots of different people and be a caregiver to our clients, as well as to publish and to teach. Um, there's just too, met, too many things to then also ha be able to prioritize family um, and the, the society pressure that's put on us as women to maintain the family. And have you seen, as you all have put these calls out, greater numbers of, of women responding? Are you seeing? Oh, huge, huge. And we sort of did the, you know, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. So we just sort of, uh, you know, did it. <laughs> and um, Scott Churchill, who is the uh, the editor, chief editor over at the Humanistic Psychologist Journal, um, he was just very supportive of it. And uh, Donna and I even are now publishing a special issue on women in humanistic psychology that should be out later in the month. And it features all women authors, all women your reviewers and Donna and I, Donna and I were the editors of that issue. That is huge because I can tell you my my couple times going to a Division Thirty Two, and this is I'm not trying to be critical here, but I'm just saying, and this was years ago. Um, but the number of white men and men in general who were kind of dominating in that space, even though there were many women, and and it was kind of set up in a way that it was it was, you know I, I love hearing this because I think. I saw Donna kind of coming into the leadership of Division 32 and then starting. You know, there were several other women who started to move into leadership posts. It just really uh, it excites me to see this happening in a way that is um, it, times are changing. And that's a great thing. It's a wonderful transition because our new president is Gina Belton, who is also, I believe she's in the uh, Integrative Studies. Integrative Medicine and Health Sciences, yeah. Yep. And uh, so Gina Belton is our current Division 32 president. And her, uh, so in the March conference that's coming up, it's going to be about uh, radical hospitality, which is a feminist and indigenous um, perspective on, you know, how do we be together? When I serve you, there is a reciprocity that that happens too. When I host someone in my home, I'm not just the host who's making the food and cleaning the house. Um, my guests are also bringing their stories. They're bringing entertainment. They're bringing, you know, connection to me. And so there is that back and forth relationship that occurs. That is so, so wonderful. I, well, I, you know, from, you know, my perspective, I am so thrilled to see this happening and and uh, count me as a, a, a supporter in whatever way I can from my office. Um, you know, so if I can blast anything out on my end on email, you got it. Thank you. We will take you up on that for sure. That'd be awesome. In fact, there could be a podcast episode where we feature the uh, women psychologists of our time, the women humanistic psychologists. I love it. Do a panel. Yeah. 
one of the events that got this uh, this is special issue that Donna and I are working on um, started was when the Me-, Me Too movement happened. And a really neat thing happened with the Me Too movement. Yes, it was terribly, you know, distressing. Um, I'm someone who's a sexual assault survivor myself, and it felt very validating for me to hear all of the stories of other women. And from a humanistic perspective, what was happening there was um, what what some feminist psychologists call is um, feminist empathy, or um, sometimes it's called uh, true or real empathy, meaning that there is no, we weren't looking for justice. We weren't looking for punishment. This was about people sharing stories so that people, so that others in society could understand what that experience was like. And so when the Me Too movement happened, there was a group of psychologists who came together, women psychologists, to tell their stories as psychologists. It was me too, as a psychologist. And um, what we noticed is that there is, uh, there needs to be a space for women to share those experiences and to talk in the way that women do, um, which he, uh, he economically, uh, we see that women tend to be more relational in the stories that they tell. So in this special issue that's coming up, you're going to hear some autobiographical narratives um, from people. So um, not just empirically based studies, but also this happened to me and it still has value in terms of being generalizable to the larger society. That's awesome. We, we need to get some excerpts out there so, for those who don't subscribe to the journal so we can get that public if we can as well. Yeah, that'd be terrific. You know, I was I was just struck by when I first got here, there was a lot of history myths going on, right? So as a my background is in educational sociology and history. And so I'm always attuned to kind of hearing how and listening and reading how people twist things a little bit to their own perspective, right? Typically to their own privileged position. And I love Saybrook so much. I think there's so many wonderful things. And I think there there has been a a, for, a forgetting, how whatever that's grounded in. But when I reached out to find out more about the history, it was, it was all these men. It was, was Rollo Mann, and Carl Rogers and James Bugenthal and, Carl, you know, Abraham Maslow and all these people were part of Saybrook's founding. And you know what? There wasn't a single woman mentioned until Eleanor Criswell. I found out. Charlotte Buell, Bugen, Bueller, Bueller. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I find these, these two amazing women and then, you know, they kind of got passing mention, but then when I, I met with uh, Eleanor in her home at Novato and we got to talking and, you know, she's very, very, you know, um, I, I would, I would say a little bit unassuming about what she was able to bring forth. And she, you know, and I said, Eleanor, you realize that entire story you just told me, you basically were the core reason Saybrook exists today, right? <laughs> like we would not be around here if it weren't for you. And and it was so funny because she goes, I I guess I've never thought about it that way. But uh, you know, I appreciate that. And I think we have to do a better job collectively, individually, to really, you know, uh take some accountability for bringing those stories forth and and supporting women and telling their stories whatever that looks like in terms of getting out of the way, stepping into support, however that may be beneficial. Yes, I agree. Women, women, but also um, Black Americans, Indigenous Americans, you know, people who their stories have been lost and um, pushed away, pushed over by other narratives. And so we do have to return to that. Um, And that's one of the things, uh, there's an upcoming book from the APA. It's a new evidence-based practices in humanistic psychology. And there's going to be an entire um, chapter that's dedicated to women in humanistic psychology. And one of the things we're going to do is trace some of our roots back to our founding women. And so Eleanor Creswell will be one of the ones that um, is going to be featured in that chapter. Well, keep me posted. I'll I'll buy or, uh, you know, procure whatever I need to procure. That's just terrific. So thank you for that. So we're getting, we get, we're coming to a close here. So I got three key questions because you're, uh, you know, the associate department chair and you've got uh, a big job and, and you, you help bring in our students and understanding their uh, way forward to Saybrook. What steps should a Saybrook individual, an individual considering Saybrook consider 
as they apply for admission into the clinical psychology program? Uh, any tips you think would help them be most successful? Yeah, I think it's going to be really important to get the support of your family. Um, just like we're talking about, you're bringing in your full self into this program. Um, we don't expect you to have to leave a whole part of your life outside of this program. And so you're going to want to make sure that your family is on board with this. This is going to be a lot of reading, writing, um, flying out for our residential learning experiences. Um, sometimes you're going to have to take time off of work to attend to your class expectations. And so you're going to need the support of, of your family and friends who are going to be with you through this whole process. That's great. That's great. And and do you have in particular, you know, if a student is maybe a, an okay writer, they're not sure about their capabilities, what, any words of encouragement for those individuals around? Yeah, we have a wonderful writing center at Saybrook um, that will help support you. And also at our residential learning experience, um, we have several writing labs where a faculty member can um, sit alongside you and help you with some of the main things um, that you need to know for writing in an APA style, because that's the style that we use here uh, at Saybrook. All right, great. So last two questions, and these are quick takes, you know, so real short, um, kind of fun. You've already answered this one really super well already, but I think what we want is the, the Vanessa Brown, the Dr. Vanessa Brown take to you. What does humanistic mean? Humanistic means looking at the full human experience, you and all your you-ness and trusting that you're the expert on your own experience. Love it. That is perfect. That's, that's one of the most unique answers we've had here today in all of our interviews. Awesome. All right. Big last question. Um, all right. With all the change that's going on in the world, we've got mental health crises. We've got all sorts of stuff going on. What are three things that people can do right now to take care of their own mental health? The first thing that I would recommend every single person do um, is to sit back and focus on empathy. We are all in this in different ways with different capacities, but we are all in this together on the same planet. Um, so we do need to have some compassion and empathy for one another um, that we're all in it together, right? So I think that would be number one is to have some empathy for each other. Um, number two is to um, see through all of the divisiveness that's happening and look at what the larger picture is. Um, so just like I said, you know, we can't reduce things to the parts. Um, what is going to be the thing that gets us through it? Okay, so uh, one of the things that we miss because of our political divisiveness is that uh, there's this beautiful planet Earth right here, and um, all of the climate psychologists are telling us we need to pay attention. There are some big, big things happening here. Um, so I would say, you know, take a bigger look. What is the bigger picture here that you might be missing because we are so honed in on replying to Facebook madness, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the third thing I would say um, is to find yourself somebody in your life, whether it's a therapist or a close friend, close loved one, um, who is going to be able to sit with you sometimes and listen and just let you talk. Um, so that for me is my husband. At the end of the day, we have um, 20 minutes where we say, okay, you go, tell me about your day. And I just listen, no advice, just validating. Um, and then he does the same. He gets to tell me what, what went, what was wonderful in his day, what was the worst part of his day, and I just listen, no advice. Great, great examples. Before you go today, Dr. Brown, anywhere that you have out there on the interwebs where you'd like to refer people to for books, websites, any of that? Obviously, you need to go to sabrick.edu because that's where all of our resources are going to be. But I also would want to want to refer everyone to the shpconference.com website. That's where you can check out that upcoming March conference um, where myself, Gina Belton, and Donna Rockwell are going to be rocking it out with our conference committee. Awesome. Okay. And can they find you on LinkedIn and all the relevant websites as well? I'm not on LinkedIn. I, I do not. Uh, I'm not easily found, but I'm easily found within the Sabre community. So you can email me anytime and we will set up a Zoom meeting to hang out. 
All right. That sounds good. So you can find Dr. Vanessa Brown at www.saybrook.edu. Just type it in in the search bar and shpconference.com has some fabulous information on the upcoming work being done by Dr. Brown and colleagues. Vanessa, thank you so much for lending us your expertise and your wisdom today. It's been awesome. Thank you, Nathan. Oh my gosh, that was just wonderful, Vanessa. Thank you again. And I hope all of you enjoyed Dr. Brown as much as I did. Remember her three major takeaways. Sit back and focus on empathy. Number two, see through the divisiveness and look at the larger picture. What gets us through it, through this life, through this uh, world that we live in, maybe step out of the Facebook world and step into the 3D world and really think about how do we get through this together? What are our anchors? And third, find someone to let you just talk, someone who will just listen. No advice, just listening. If you want to see the video segments, we've created these on our YouTube page. Check them out. They're fun. They're fabulous. Our terrific a uh, wonderful uh, producer, Phil Jean Grand, did these, and they're so awesome. If you'd like to support the podcast, go to Apple iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review and subscribe so you can get episodes as they come out. If you're on Spotify, leave that five-star rating and make sure to follow us. You can, of course, subscribe to us on our most major podcasts, on most major podcast platforms, including Google, Stitcher, Pandora, and others. Remember to check out our show notes for information on today's guests, including links to the websites that she mentioned, books, etc. For more about our clinical psychology program or the university, go to www.saybrook.edu. Click on areas of study at the top of the page and locate the program to learn more or simply Google Saybrook University Clinical Psychology Program. All right, that's it, everyone. Take care, be well, and be good to one another. 